I'm Al Phil Reese, and this is Poem Talk at the Writer's House, where I have the pleasure of convening three friends in the world of contemporary poetry and poetics to collaborate on a close but not too close reading of a poem. We'll talk, maybe even disagree a bit, and perhaps open up the verse to a few new possibilities, and we hope gain for a poem that interests us some new readers and listeners. And I say listeners because Poem Talk poems are available in recordings made by the poets themselves as part of our Penn Sound Archive, writing.upenn.edu slash Penn Sound. Poem Talk and Mod Poe have gone on the road again. Anna Strong Safford and Chris Martin and Zach Cardner and I have traveled from Philadelphia to Boston. And this afternoon, we have decamped at the Woodbury Poetry Room inside Lamont Library at Harvard University in Cambridge and are joined here in this lovely space by Bonnie Costello, teacher, critic, editor, longtime faculty member at Boston University, whose early books on Marianne Moore and Elizabeth Bishop are among the first to appear on those poets, whose edition of the Letters of Moore I regularly consult. Bonnie, it's right there. You need to have Moore's letters. Amazing work on that book, whose books and articles on Stevens, Auden, Ashbery, Ammons, and others have been important to so many of us, whose work in recent years has explored landscape and environmental poetry, and whose 2017 study, The Plural of Us, is the first book, so far as I know, anyway, about the poet's use of the first-person plural voice. And by Stephanie Burt, poet, critic, teacher on the faculty here at Harvard, described by the New York Times as, quote, one of the most influential poetry critics of her generation, unquote, whose collections of books include Advice from the Lights 2017 and Belmont 2013, among others, and among whose works of criticism are The Poem is You, 60 Contemporary American Poems and How to Read Them 2016, and Close Calls with Nonsense, Reading New Poetry 2009, and whose very widely read articles and reviews about poetry appear in the Boston Review, the New York Times Book Review, Slate, TLS, the London Review of Books, and the Yale Review, and by the aforementioned Anna Strong Safford, poet, critic, editor, teacher, who teaches creative writing and modern and contemporary U.S. poetry and poetics, whose poems have appeared variously in Supplement, Cleaver, Peregrine, and elsewhere, who is a curricular specialist and faculty member in the School of Liberal and Professional Studies at the University of Pennsylvania, I know that place, <laughs> and is my close colleague at the Kelly Writers House and in the teaching of poetry to tens of thousands of people worldwide through our ModPo course and who with me is currently editing a book of 50 short essays by 50 poets, each about one poem to be published by the University of Pennsylvania Press and possibly to be titled, The Difference is Spreading. Mm. They may not, I love that title. I don't know where we're, we're gonna be allowed to do it because it's confusing anyway. Anna, thank you for we're schlepping gonna, up here. We're gonna fight for it, From man. Philadelphia. We're gonna fight for our title. Hi, <laughs> oh. how are you? I'm good. You're good? <laughs> Bonnie, it's good to see you. You too. Twice in this recent period. I we know. just saw each other in California. It's the poetry magnet, I guess. <laughs> and you live a little you live a little ways from here. How long a drive? Oh, uh, it's or about a commute. forty five minute drive. I'm in I'm in Boston, but I'm at the opposite end of the metropolitan area. Yeah, I don't know much about that, but it sounds like yeah. a a big you know. A it's long a different world home. down there. <laughs> <laughs> And Stephanie, Hi. It's good to see you. Hi, and you didn't you. have a big commute. You walked from your office, no doubt. Uh, no, I took a bus in from my house. I go. live only 15 minutes away, though, on this side of the river. So Fantastic. Yeah. Well, having you on Poem Talk and you, long overdue. It's an honor. Good to see you both. Well, today the four of us have gathered here to talk about a work by Tanya Foster called A Swarm of Bees in High Court, published in 2015 by Belladonna a section of which includes a sequence of paired haiku. We're going to talk about five of those haiku pairs. If you're following along in your copy of the book, you'll want to know that these pairs appear on pages 38, 39, 42, 46, and 50 of the book, and that the pair on page 50 forms the final page of a long section of the book called In Somniloquies. So here now, in a recording specially made by the poet for this episode of Poem Talk, is Tanya Foster, 
performing these five pages of A Swarm of Bees in High Court. Late night, commercials would talk like urgent auctions in uncrowded rooms. Late night commercials make her turn the TV down so as not to wake him. He's asleep after telling her about the boy he was, his father's fist. He's asleep she can't fall to, a nap that won't keep or unkink. Knots of a woman who ain't numb with want, who's not effaced by shut eyes. Knots form this woman who sugars her mustards, who want but never ask. She wants a sleep that shudders thought like the sparse corner bodega. She wants a sleep shut against the neighborhood graffiti of noise. This hive of sound, bass buzz, engine crank, voices laugh, seal the sonic cracks. This hive of sound bruises her last 2 a.m. nerve as it beats blind us. There is no need to go in any order here, but I just want to arbitrarily start with the first pair, but we can go whatever, whichever way you like. But bear with me, let's start with the first one. So we've got a pair of haiku, and they are to some degree, Stephanie, a rewriting of, one is a rewriting of the other in yes. some ways. So I guess we should start there. How does this pair seem to have been rewritten and what's the significance, if any? So this is two scenes that are one scene. Yeah. Should we talk about the rules of haiku though? Yeah, Because one more than a lot of forms that Tanya Faster could have chosen, this is a form that comes with a ton of thematic and organizational history and expectation. Um, Haiku come to us from Japan, where if you want to write an entirely traditional haiku, you have to have some kind of semantic leap from one part to another, and a unified mood, otherwise it's not a traditional haiku, and a reference to a season, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, of course, that's alongside the 575 syllabic requirement of haiku which Foster does not always follow. What she takes from that form is not just the 575 approximate shape, mm -hmm. but the sense of compression and the sense that this is a scene and that the poem is one take. But because these are paired haiku, we're getting often paired takes on the same moment, the same scene, the same two people and the same two people in a network. This is a book about hives and bees and urban grids and you know, multifamily buildings and networks. So what's happening in these two? Well, we already know because it's called insomniloquies that we're gonna have someone who maybe should be asleep but isn't. <laughs> and <laughs> it's because of the night. I am. What? The, the, the initial in, in, in insomniloquies, yeah. Yeah. Right, right. yeah. So late night commercials with talk like urgent auctions in uncrowded rooms. We don't have any pronouns in there, right? When you are looking around and you don't see anyone else and you want to describe what you see rather than how you're feeling, you probably don't use pronouns. So this is our point of view figure who's going to turn out to be almost certainly an adult woman hearing television commercials and thinking about the place of those commercials in that moment in that multifamily dwelling in, in the larger context of the book, it's gotta be Harlem, in her life, in her domestic life, and also in a specifically African-American historical context. Because the word auction is gonna be one of a number of words in this sequence that have additional resonance and additional semantics tied up in them. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes horrific ones, as here, and sometimes sort of comic ones, 
that come from specifically African American history. Because an urgent auction out of context could just be somebody trying to sell a painting at Sotheby's or somebody trying to sell impounded cars. But there is, of course, a history here of, of evil auctions. And then that goes away. All of that macro historical context goes away in the second haiku where she, and we get a pronoun, and it's a third person pronoun, gets up to do something. There is a him, there is a probably domestic partner who should not be awakened by the noise of what's going on around them in their probably apartment. And we have the dynamic that runs throughout this whole book of how does the macro social context of a domestic life, of life in a city, of life in a historically black part of the city, how does that guide and channel and shape and limit and enable the micro interpersonal emotional life of these characters? That is a fabulous start. Thank you, Stephanie. So, Bonnie, let's pick it up from there. Can we look at that first pair and talk about what actually happens when we, when the poet slightly changes things. Give us a couple of examples of uh, that, and I'll ask Anna to do the same. Yeah, I mean, I kept thinking um, just to, be f in terms of revision and, uh, uh, and the process here, that it reminded me of reading Dickinson, yet you get to keep all the changes and all the <laughs> options, <laughs> you know, uh, slight alterations that kind of up, turn the poem upside down. Or, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you know, so m my first question was late night, comma, commercial. Mm. So what happens when that comma goes away? Why yeah. is that not there? Let's do that. That's so, something that we do as teachers and yeah. literary critics. So let's, right. let's get into that. Go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, um, you know, I think, first of all, uh, the emphasis gets on, on the setting, on the, on the time frame first, in the first one, with the comma, the night is set apart, um, you know, we're in a, and then, um, uh, whereas it, late night just becomes, in the second one, simply becomes modifier of commercial. Compound adjective right. modifying so late, the night time isn't quite so, so central right. to the line. Um, and uh, I also felt uh, that, it, you know, one, one feels that the, well, these poems don't exactly have speakers in the traditional sense. I mean, they, you know, one of the things I, I struggled with, and I think these, you know, these little punctuation marks uh, reveal this, how much are these poems to be heard or to be seen? You know, the question of the visual element, mm -hmm. the, the auditory element, and then the articulatory element, too, because I think it's in your mouth, you know. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but certainly... Um, uh, you know, there's a there's a different pace to late night commercials than late night commercials. Yes. You know, um, and uh, but but I also felt more solitude in the first one. You know, in some is a very interesting um, title for a number of reasons. I like the wordplay, and she's a great poet of wordplay. Yes. But she but she um, here is, um, you know, a, a soliloquy is usually not addressed to anybody present. There is a presence here we find out in the next in the second one, uh, but a sleeping presence. So it's like right. one of Auden's lullabies or something, you know. Um, but it feels very solitary at first, and then you know the uncrowded room, uh, the noise of life and the outer world is coming through the TV, mm. and I felt at least a, a kind of solitude in the first one. Yes. But she's as we learn as she in the her pronoun of the second one, mm -hmm. is taking the weight of all that to herself because she turns it down. She's heard it. She, the impact of it is there, but she's protecting her beloved yeah. by, uh, by turning it down. So I felt that was a, revealed a tremendous amount about turn... the dynamic of this relationship, yeah. that she's a, she's a protector in a certain yes. way. And um, yes. later on, we see different manifestations of this. Yes. So, um, you know, there is... Uh, 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 and of course, the second line of each poem is quite uh, of, of each of these is quite different. So we, you know, with talk like urgent auctions be, uh, is replaced by make her turn the TV down. 
Um, but of course, the, the talk carries forward. We know that's why she's turning the TV down. One of the things I, I thought about as I was reading these, is, well, they're pairs. What does it mean to be a pair? Sometimes a pair is a contrast or an inversion. Sometimes a pair is a development. Yeah. In this case, I felt it was more like a development, mm -hmm. something happening and then a reaction you know, from the inside to an action that takes place. Thank you. Here's what I'd like to do, starting with Anna. I'd like to go around, all four of us, so I'll play this game as well. Uh, pick any moment in any of the five pairs where you see the pairing work particularly well to create meaning. So this is going to be a lightning round. Everybody does it quickly. Uh, and I didn't give you a chance to prepare for that. No, I think I have one. Okay, um, let's go around. So Anna, then Steph, then Bonnie, then me, we'll go around, give one example of the effectiveness, uh, uh, the effectiveness of the pairing. So I'm on, I'm on 46. 46, so yeah. that is? She wants to sleep. Yep. That pair. So one thing that I, I, um, I really like Stephanie's term uh, to think about these paired haiku as takes, like two different takes on, mm -hmm. um, or to think about pairing as like revision or like another mm. perspective or um, as a, is it a development or is it a contrast? Second um, thoughts. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, or so, then again. Yeah. Like the Williams poem with the uh, car. Do you know that one? Mm -hmm. The how, young housewife. Or, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. There's oh, that's a, take, a weird one. And then another and take. And then yeah. I pass solitary in my car. Yeah. 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 So there's like that. Yeah. Like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the ways that, that Tanya Foster really does this really effectively is by building these sonic relationships across the two mm -hmm. haiku yeah. mm -hmm. um, in each pair. So I'm thinking about not only that the first line in each is repeated to indicate that there's like this real relationship. So she wants a sleep that shutters thought like the sparse. And then I'm gonna to jump to the second pair, shut against the neighborhood. So it's, it's revisions in not only the um, content of the haiku, but also like building these sonic relationships that to me really um, troubled my typical reading practice, which would be to read one and then read the other and then move on. Um, instead, I found myself reading one, reading the next, and then really stacking the two against one another and seeing like where these sound relationships yeah. um, kind of built up and bumped up against one another. Great example. Stephanie, your turn, lightning round. Page 39. 39. 39. He is asleep after telling her about the boy he was, his father's fists. He's asleep. She can't fall to a nap that won't keep or unkink. And in all, all or almost all of the paired haiku in these begin with the same or similar first line that is, is often altered. This is a wonderful alteration because it changes not just the meaning but the grammatical structure without taking our focus off the male partner who's sleeping while the woman who's the focal center of the poem is awake. We get in the first frame his history, which is embodied in, in him. He's someone whose sensitivity and whose trouble and whose need for protection comes from what's probably his history of being subject to corporal punishment, to what we would certainly call today uh, physical abuse. And then she takes a step back and uses the same sounds to think not about how he became him and how he sees himself, but about how she sees him, what he is mm. in her life. There is so much emotional work done by the wordplay in Foster, and that's not just this poem, that's throughout this book. That's one of the things I love so much about this book, its density. Uh, Lorene Niedeker comes mm. to mind as, as a direct precursor for this. Um, he's asleep, she can't fall to, a nap that won't keep or unkink. There's so much wordplay in there. Um, she can't lie down with him. She can't sleep when he sleeps because she is awake thinking about how to live with him and protect him. There's also a good deal of punning on what we uh, those of us who, who don't speak that dialect have learned to call African-American vernacular English versus sort of standard English, the kind that I'm speaking right now. 
uh, because fall to sounds unidiomatic in, in the dialect that I'm speaking now, but it wouldn't be in other Englishes. Nap means a lot of things, right? Yeah. Uh, and kink and unkink mean a number of things. It's as if his inability to, to change, to be other than who he is, emotionally, psychologically, is very much like whatever's going on with his curly hair, which of course there's a, a, a tradition, and a lot of people write about it, of African-American people with especially curly or knotty or kinky hair trying to straighten it, mm -hmm. um, which people have many feelings about, and uh, what's relevant here is that that is difficult to do. It doesn't always take it, it can be very painful. And she's not going to do that to him. She's not gonna to try to straighten him out and it probably wouldn't work anyway and she probably shouldn't. Especially when you think of straighten out as like a word that would be used um, to uh, justify punishment. Like I'm gonna straighten right, you out. Right, and she doesn't say that, she says unkink. Yeah. And the, the sexual meaning of kink is not foregrounded here but it's somewhere in the penumbra of meanings that the word can have. Kink, I think here is what William Empson, one of my favorite critics, and I hope he would have liked this book, would call a complex word. It means a lot of different things, and the constellations of things that these words, nap and kink and maybe even sleep, uh, the constellation of things these words have meant are all present in the way that Foster deploys them. And that's typical of her poetry. It's one of the reasons I like it so much. Yes. Um, th th what you did with unkink was just unkink was just brilliant, and just to foreground the third meaning, which you did refer to, but just to push it a little further, the stress and anxiety that's post-traumatic here from the childhood be of being beaten. Yeah, is you know the choice you have when you love someone who had suffered trauma as yeah. a child is, do I try to rescue this person? Do I try to straighten this person out? Or do I stand guard and be vigilant and yeah. let them continue to be? Kinked and, as opposed to And there's almost out. always a right answer, which is don't come and just try to fix the people you love that doesn't exactly. work. Exactly. And you know, that's like a common thing, yeah. a common feeling in relationships, but that doesn't mean it shouldn't be written about complexity yes. in a poem. And all you that's know, let's do it. created with just by taking the word asleep and breaking it. Yes. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Bonnie, <laughs> it's gonna be your turn, but I wanted to play the game too, so I'll go first. Um, yeah. On 42, the pairs, uh, the, the, I just want to point out the first lines of the two, uh, of the two uh, haiku there. Knots of woman, K-N-O-T-S, knots of woman, and then knots form this woman, N-O-T-S. And all I'll say, it, keeping to the lightning round format uh, and being really brief about this, is that the second is a great way of describing how a being, how an identity can be formed by absences, by thing by negation. Knots being told this now. Woman. Knots of a woman is a version of this partner who is kinked by the trauma of childhood, but she herself, the speaker or focalizing presence here, um, is complicated, maybe complicated by that relationship, and maybe already complicated, but we don't find too much about that. Uh, but knots from this woman is just a very powerful alternative way of talking about identity formed by negation. Yes. All right, How, that was fun. Bonnie, your turn. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'll follow up on the poem that you oh, great. That opened you. up here. Um, since we're on that one, I, I certainly was very interested in that uh, you know, way that her the taking on the pain of the other while denying one's own emotional needs you know, is part of the narrative here, and it evolves from pair to pair. So these really do work as a sequence, I think, you know, though they're not numbered or anything. Um, um, these are poems, they're very, the compression that Stephanie mentioned, I think is, is, is very, uh, something that I'm very aware of, and it rewards thinking uh, deeply about these poems, they swell. There's a lot of white space, but it isn't wasted white space mm -hmm. by any means. Mm -hmm. um, but just to follow up with this poem, there is, so there are these very simple words and very simple diction, knots from this woman, you know, um, monosyllabic, 
maybe two syllables. Is it knots from or knots form? Knots form. Knots Sorry, form, did I say yeah. from knots form this woman? Yes. But then we get, you know, who sugars her mustards, which is like, I mean, these are not rare words one needs to look up, but that phrase is not one that most of us are familiar with mm -hmm. outside maybe of this community that she's describing. So I, um, you know, I got very curious about that. It, it, it flashes out. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I looked up the slang for mustard. What is mustard means good, means, you know, the sauce means something mm -hmm. plus, you know. So this is something that she's uh, you're kind of stepping back from herself and looking at what she's doing emotionally here. Yes. She's, she is, uh, you know, uh, she's trying to appeal to this other person uh, presumably, to cut the mustard is to be up to the standard. Yes, um, you cut know. the mustard is certainly in there, right? Yeah, I mean all of that. But the uh, so um, and the phrase kind of you know is showy in that way. And yet there's uh, then the next word phrase you know uh, sh who cut who sugars her mustards who want but never ask um, reveals the emotional cost. I think of the kind of behavior that's emerged in this uh, relationship, and also where she's not. turning TVs down. She's trying to present herself yes. in a way that will appeal, and so on and so forth. So, and I was, I was thinking about sugars. Or like, my only relationship to sugaring mustard would be to like make a mustard glaze uh -huh. for like a ham. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, so I was th that that like Langston Hughes. It sugars over, and yeah. this is so mm. much like yeah. uh, Hughes. So there's mm. there. I, there oh, sorry, go on. I was just gonna say. I was just. It, this really, this this particular haiku to me just made me think about domestic labor and like, sort of unseen, unrecognized domestic labor. The amount of work that goes into so many domestic tasks on like a small scale and on like mm -hmm. a big scale. Um, if you're doing a mustard glaze on like a ham, say, um, that's probably for like a nice dinner or holiday or some kind of like big gathering. And you just um, uh, the kind of person who will want but never ask, who ain't numb with want, who's sort of erased by people's eyes that are shut to that work that it takes to, to do all of this. Um, yeah, I was, I was thinking about, that. it just made me think of domestic labor, mm -hmm. that's all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so much that. Extremely Niedeker, yeah. extremely Louis Niedeker there. This is absolutely, Foster's one of the true heirs of Niedeker sure. in this respect. And these small forms for overlooked labor. Um, now, what does she bring to that tradition of these small poems about overlooked labor? A lot. One of them is the relation to histories of domestic violence. What does it mean to be with someone who's already damaged? Yeah. One of them is this image, who's not effaced by shut eyes. The paradox here is that, of course, as most of us do, she wants to be seen and recognized for the work that she's doing. But she can't be because if she's doing it correctly, he'll keep sleeping. He literally won't see her because his eyes are closed. Yeah. And that speaks back to, and it's one of the negations that she lives with, one of her knots. It also speaks back to sugaring your mustards because I looked that up too. Mm -hmm. It's got to be mustard it, greens, isn't it? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it could be. Yeah. Um, but I, I you know, just asked Dr. Google, um, I'm not a historian of Southern cuisine or of African American cuisine or of any cuisine. Um, and the first you know, billion things that I got were glazed hams. But I don't think she's making them a ham. It could be mustard greens, but I've never heard anyone say mustards for mustard greens. I think you'd just say greens. And I found what appears to be a 19th century proverb Sugar your mustard if you're wise, which else with tears will fill your eyes. Say that again, that's great. Sugar, this isn't a, a, a this is just Googling things. This is a, a book of 19th century verse proverbs. Sweeten the bitterness in other words. Right, right. And, and even more specific than that, it's about uh, do something so you don't cry in the performance of your daily tasks. It's right. like, right. Uh, what, I forget what you do to an onion so you won't cry when you're cutting an onion. Don't cut an onion. I don't well, think there's much you can do. But, well, <laughs> but there's, I mean, I, I think there actually are folk remedies where you can put something under your nose or um, sugar your mustard if you're wise, which else 
with tears will fill your eyes. This is a woman who's got a set of learned and strongly gendered ways to avoid being reduced to tears by the invisible domestic labor that she's gonna go on performing and is perhaps right to perform. Because that's another beautiful thing about what Foster's doing. There's a history, Audrin Rich, early in her career, did this beautifully, of poems about invisible gender domestic labor where the, the emotional arc of the poem is blow it all up, burn it down, get the hell out of there. Mm -hmm. And that's great. That's valuable feminist energy. That's not what's happening here. Uh, wow, is what I want to say in response to that, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you. So let us, Bonnie, starting with you, figure out the amazing work that's done in the grammar of that second haiku on 42, because we've got two who's. We have two who clauses. And I think, Bonnie, I'm, just gonna, I'm gonna turn it to you in a second, but I think what's happening is that the second, which introduces the only verb, will, which is embedded in the who, the second is moving along. The first, even though there's not a comma that precedes it, strikes me as a restrictive clause, a who clause that's doing some defining work, and that the main clause is knots form this woman who'll, who will want but never ask. So if, if I'm right, and I might be wrong, say more, is it possible that what Stephanie just did introduces the question of a metapoetic moment where the work is being done by the poet who has created this character? Yeah, and, and who is doing increasingly hard work in the second pair. Um, what do you think of all that? Well, did that's I a over, lot to chew on. Did I overread? No, no, I'm interested. I mean, I, I did feel like the sugar, sir, mustard was one of those great moments that poets have where they're doing what they're saying. Yeah. You know? And mm -hmm. so yes. in that sense, it's metapoetic right away. Um, and I did notice... Um, that, I mean, you know, the, there's a Steinian element in her work uh, that, I mean, that she turns to great uh, meaning and purpose always. There's nothing mere wordplay. Never, not just cleverness here. It's always very directed and deep. And uh, but the the the, um, the who's you know uh, becomes uh, uh, well. You, you you know Wallace Stevens, so you know how Wallace Stevens makes the who hoot, you know, that there's a, this sort of, and she's looking for a who, like there's a kind of vacuum here. I was waiting for Stevens here. to come into this. Um, <laughs> I noticed when you read the poem um, that, um, that there's, you, you, in the first section, you could read it a couple of different ways, you know, knots of a woman who ain't numb with want, who's not. Then, yes. Who's not a, as, who's as not, another who clause, or, or is the poet turning right. to the reader? But it's a question. Who's not effaced by shut eyes? Suddenly, there's a direct address, right. you know, in this very lonely in other sequence. Words, there's I a am. suddenly a who's not is a way of saying I am indeed. Exactly. You know, well, it's uh, um, who shall say he's I'm not asleep. Being. So who else is she going to talk to? Yeah. But the reader. Um, and so then, with the double hooing that goes on, uh, even with. The, the, the two who's that have been hollowed out, you know, you pointed out the kind of knots make a substance here, the double negatives, that there's an affirmative there, so yeah. the double who's, yeah. Yeah. I think also yeah. sort of trying to find a self here that can be asserted in the midst of all this sacrifice. Yeah. Stephanie and Anna on this, and then I have another thing I'd like the four of us to do. Stephanie first. So... Thank you, yes. I'm thinking about why I feel certain of how to read Who's Not Effaced by Shut Eyes mm -hmm. and of the way it works as a transition in the styptic. And I'm realizing that for me at least, the, the first panel of this diptych is universalizing. This is a woman who's got a lot of knots in her perhaps her back or her other muscles because she's stressed out and because she's performing domestic labor. And that connects her to most of us, 
most of us are not numb with want. Most of us have some sense of how we feel and what we want, whether it's what we want for breakfast or what we want from our partners if we're partnered or, right? Most of us, if asked, you know, how do you want your day to go, can say something. Who's not a face by shut eyes is also universalizing. Mm -hmm. When you close your eyes to go to sleep, whoever you are, whoever's in the room with you, you no longer see that person. That's about all or most human beings, right? But then we get another glimpse of the same woman with the same sounds initially in a way that separates her from most people because most people are not constantly in danger of crying from the performance of their daily task. Most people, I hope, I could be wrong, don't constantly feel erased. Most people, and this could actually be really wrong when you add up the categories, but the sort of default generic subject of lyric poetry is able to ask for things. So are you and suggesting that the A woman and this woman are not the same woman? No, no, they're the same woman viewed from different sides. Uh -huh. mm. One side universalizes her predicament as someone who's not seen when her partner sleeps, as someone who has desires. And the other side, the second frame, the second haiku, uh, minoritizes or sets her apart as someone who is unusually boxed in. Or at least unusually, particularizes. Right. Yes. Particularizes is another, yeah. yeah. She, she's not like a lot of people. She does something unusual. She has an unusual predicament. And of course, that's the way that the subject of lyric poetry almost always works. Anything, any poem that I want to call lyric, there's a way into it that connects it to an imagined generic reader, to you, to me, and another way into it in which you can say there's something very special and recognizable about this imagined speaking subject. Mm. And it's not normally this schematic or self-conscious. But that's arguably, at least for me, I don't know, Bonnie, whether you would, would agree with this. No, I'm persuaded, although I have to hold on to my hovering in the second line of the first one, because I do think it functions both ways. Who's not a face by shut eyes? But the who's not has an end, you know, phrases at the ends of lines yeah. take on an integrity outside of the whole of a sure. sentence. And since not, she is a not in the second one, this yeah. prepares us for it. Yeah, it's she's the signaling link. forward. Can, can we right. talk about alliteration for like a minute? We can talk about alliteration and then we're gonna go to the, to the last pair. Okay. But I also want to get Anna in. So let's do Anna, let's Anna and Anna first, yeah. What are your thoughts at this point? <laughs> um, oh, I'm so, I, I love uh, Bonnie's idea about reading the who's not at the end as, as having its own relationship with just that line and then also being a bridge uh, to the second. Um, I have this weird thing where, because I wear contact lenses, mm -hmm. if I t have taken my contacts out, I sort of assume, like, I see everything as extremely blurry, and I assume that I am also blurry to everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> it's like this really weird, I, like, cognitively, I can't square. Like, children cover their head yeah. Yeah. and like, say, yeah. you can't see me, right? I, I guess I'm exactly a child. Exactly like that. <laughs> I, guess, I guess I just have, like, kid logic there. Oh. Um, but I, so I'm thinking about being a face by shut eyes, being, like, as soon as, if you, if you shut your eyes because you're asleep, like you're a sleeping partner who no longer sees you, is no longer thinking about you. If you're, if you're an insomniac, which we kind of can guess that the speaker is, given the title of the section in, in somnolo, what, what is it? In somniloquy. Thank you. <laughs> somniloquies. I can picture the word in my head, but I absolutely That's a neologism it. for sure, yeah, right? right? Somniloquies. Right, being asleep, being someone who cannot sleep, and then speaking to my, is this empty room, you know, my partner's asleep, my partner can't hear me, so I gotta just like speak this to the, to the quiet You've room. You've really made mo much more, for me, emotionally powerful, the transition through the gap between the haiku on the page yeah. down to the next knots form this woman. Knots now include not seeing and not being seen. Mm -hmm. That's a big knot. That is a it big, is an, a big and it negative. Just, I really feel in this particular section, I really feel just how burdened the speaker is with all yes. of this domestic labor. Yes. It's not just sugaring the mustards. It's to me, sugaring the mustards um, reminds me a little bit of um, uh, Dickinson's "Tell All the Truth, But Tell It Slam." Mm. You know, this this need to like soften the like tang of the mustard for mm -hmm. someone right, else. This, right. The way that this speaker is taking on all of the emotional and domestic labor like of this situation, you're dealing with perhaps a partner mm. who is um, dealing with an awful lot 
of trauma. Yep. Yep. So the, the speaker, I think, in this particular section, I really feel the way that the speaker has taken on so much of that load of yeah. needing to deal yes. with all of the complicated. Isn't it interesting. Yeah. In addition that, to all of the yeah. food stuff. Oh, it's <laughs> when they contemplate what Dickinson calls success, circuit, which lies in circuit, yeah. success in circuit lies. When they do that, when they imagine that the poem or the work that they do in their room is a way to deal with this burdensome reality, then they wind up doing incredibly, I'm setting up alliteration here, um, they wind up doing incredibly hard poetic work. Yeah. Success in Circuit Lies is about as sissy, as essy as you possibly can at the moment when the poem decides there is no directness that's going to be appropriate at this point. Right. I am not going to tell these kids that lightning is, you know, thousands of volts of electricity that could make you never want to go to sleep again. I'm not going to do that. The poem is a circuit. Mm -hmm. So briefly, Stephanie, tell us about alliteration and then we're going to go to the last pair. Another wonderful thing that Foster often does is create patterns within patterns within patterns, which Auden also did, right? Auden wrote rhymed haiku near the end of his life. Um, these don't normally rhyme, but they come delightfully close to incorporating four-beat medieval alliterative lines, knots of a woman who ain't numb with want. There's four ends in there. Mm -hmm. mm. And then it's, it's as if there were a two-part alliterative line and then a kicker. Who's not effaced by shut eyes, which lineated differently, would be a regular trimeter. And then she does it again. Knots form this woman who sugars her mustards, and we've moved from an emphasis on the N to an emphasis on the M. Knots, and we've again got a midline break if we imagine living in a world where these are asymmetrical couplets instead of haiku, yeah. knots of a woman who ain't numb with want. Who's not effaced by shut eyes? Knots form this woman who sugars her mustards. Who'll want but never ask? And then the kicker there, the, the sound that stands out at the end, breaks the alliterative pattern and shuts us down with that consonant cluster on, on a, that goes from a sibilant to a closure, ask. Never ask. Mm. Mm. Um, but of course, the first time you read this, you don't see that pattern. You see the 575 of haiku. Right. There are patterns within patterns. It's very Fosterian and Dickinsonian, I guess. Yeah, I love Fosterian. OK, Bonnie, I'm going to ask you, didn't prepare this, but ask you to read the two couplets for us on page 50. And then we're going to, we're going to go once around, and each of us is going to say one thing about that. This is a really remarkable pair of poems, this last one. Yeah. And it ends this sequence, too. So Bonnie, not to load it up too much, but. Well, I'll do my best. Thank you. <laughs> This hive of sound, bass buzz, engine crank, voices laugh, seal the sonic cracks. This hive of sound bruises her last, sorry, <laughs> this hive of sound bruises her last 2 a.m. nerve as if beats blind us. Okay. One comment each on this remarkable pair. Anna, you're first. Mm, um, I love the, the way that the sounds in the first pair are really uh, consonant. Bass, buzz, engine, crank, seal, the sonic cracks. And then the sounds in the second pair are much softer. Mm -hmm. Bruises her last 2 a.m. nerve as if beats blind us. It's a much like softer, um, you know, it's, it's like a, it hypes it up and then there's like a come down. Uh, my turn, thank you. Uh, real quick, I hear this, I hear this happily, th from the point of view of the poet, not the f uh, woman we're getting to know, the speaker. Mm -hmm. From the point of view of the poet, this, this pair really participates in uh, literary history of, mm -hmm. of uh, English language poetry. I hear Eliot in the last line, and I hear uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins in the second line, the bass buzz, engine crank, hyphenation. I mean, everything gets very poetic and very dense in a very happy way for me. 
to say nothing of the Dickinsonian this. Mm. Dick, <laughs> certainly Dickinson is in there, and as we said, uh, Niedeker. Okay, Stephanie, your thought on this one? I hear Gwendolyn Brooks. I hear an outro. I hear a coda. We have had an intensely psychological series, and we have a sensory explosion. Explosion's the wrong word. A densely sensory acoustic experience that turns our attention from the emotional trajectory of the couple here to the larger and, and notably urban surround which the larger book and the structure of the book, A Swarm of Bees, A Swarm of Bees in high court is going to be about. And as if the sonic intensity were not dialed up enough in a fashion that's Brooksian and also Gerard Manley Hopkins-ish, in the first five lines of the six line unit, Foster takes us out on uh, big alliteration and on synesthesia. Mm -hmm. Those beats could be heartbeats or beats in composed music and electronica or hip hop or something else, maybe a radiator, but it's sonic, mm -hmm. but it's synesthetically affecting us and it's in quotation marks, which suggests that someone else is saying it. So you have a typographical indication that there are multiple voices in this poem. And it's really like the moment at the end of a fireworks display when everything that's left on the boat goes yes. All the fireworks go off at the end. Yes. I was thinking of that thing that you do when you're, when you're lost and you are looking at directions. So you turn your music down so that you can look at your directions. Or what? Like, right. No. <laughs> Right, in I, order to come, that's in order what I was thinking. Yes. Like, you mean turn like the sound driving? down so you yeah. can read. Yes, I love that. Okay. I think that's exactly right. Um, uh, <laughs> okay. We turn to Wait, Bonnie. Uh, I, uh, as I turn to Bonnie, the the first this, you know, my notes say these poems, this hive of sound. I mean, there's there's a reference to this is a summary summary poem among other things. Bonnie, your thought about this last pair? Oh, okay. Well, um, you know, I think sort of pulling out from uh, one of the things Stephanie had said. Certainly, I think we see here many of the things that she's done throughout the collection, not just the sequence of poems that we looked at. Right. The synesthesia is everywhere. She wants to immerse us in the senses and in the body, uh, but the body not just at one level of experience. It's very interior, but at the same time, it's intensely physical. Um, you know, there, there aren't a lot of aphorisms and philosophical sayings in this. So, so you're, you're experiencing meaning through these senses very powerfully. Um, but another thing that I, I've noted, and not so much in the, in the other haikus that we looked at, but in the book in general, there are these moments of uh, quotation. I mean, there's a dialogic thrust mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. incredibly private as, um, as these poems are in many ways, there is this sense of otherness that keeps coming in. I'm not sure where, who's being quoted here. Maybe I just don't know this quote. But what strikes me is the quotation marks themselves, that, so that there's an insertion in there. Um, so does anybody know this quote? Is I, I just video? Googled it and got nothing. It's, yeah, yeah. I got people reviewing this book. So, I think it's something someone said. Or some, or, I think it's overheard or speech. Or stepping out, stepping out from the experience. But so the, this hive, yeah, I think it is uh, a kind of summary of uh, this hive I've created, mm. um, this swarm of sounds that you know, actually has a, a pattern to it, a home. Uh, it's not just noise. Um, there's uh, also the sense of audience. That the hive, yeah, that's very strong. And I am particularly struck by it because some, so often earlier on, there was something slightly sinister about the outside world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the uh, graffiti on the, uh, well, the, the bodega that's at the corner, the graffiti noise and so on. It's not clear that that's welcome. Whereas here, I feel there's, there's something more. Yeah. If, even though she's bruised, you know, it bruises. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this hive I... of sand bruises, but there is something uh, affirmative. Stephanie, I think 
in thinking about the beat, what the beats could be a few minutes ago mentioned, I think like radiator. Could, could be, yeah. It? Yeah, I, this made me riff in my head. Um, it's going to be weird now to talk about Jack Kerouac in relation to uh, Tony Foster, but when, when Jack decided in his most experimental writing to try to write down what he heard through the open tenement window in the middle of the night in New York. Old Angel Midnight. Old Angel Midnight. Um, we, get, we get this kind of bruising. Uh, right, and the, mm. beat, the whole beatnik word has all those beat. different uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you know what? I, oh yeah. my goodness, I didn't even think about that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. It, strikes me that, it strikes me that this is a very powerful moment where, where as you just said, Bonnie, we go from a, a woman who really needs to protect herself and maybe her partner from the intrusions of the world outside, the neighborhood outside, but yet we begin, she begins to learn that that hive of sound, that sort of urban sonic density starts to actually be the poem mm -hmm. and that that's a positive thing even though it hurts. Yeah. Yes. So you're hurting from inside because the guy in the other room has suffered trauma and you've got to stay up and sort of protect. And you're hurting from outside because the poetry coming through your window bruises you at 2 a.m. and your nerves are jangled. And then you end with this poetic quote, which has the word beats in it. It's just, I, I'm very moved by this. Yeah. Look, we could talk forever about this. What I want to <laughs> do is go around and get quick final thoughts. Something you wanted to say coming to this, this gathering, but haven't had a chance to yet. So uh, about, one, about Foster. About Foster, about this book, yep. Mm -hmm. About any of the poems. Anna, you first, final thought. Um, we can I, come back to you. No, 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 I'm, uh, I wanted to talk about, um, oh, in 38, back to, all the way back to the beginning. Yes. Yeah. Um, one phrase I just really liked, and, and Stephanie did an amazing job talking about Foster's wordplay, uh, but one little bit of wordplay that we didn't get a chance to talk to was in the second pair, or the second haiku on 38, make her turn the TV down. Turn the TV down is a great little vernacular compression of actually turn the volume down. Yeah. But Which I we love- we don't do anymore. There are no dials. Right, this, right to, I'm doing this, but there's it's no- It's a thummy thing. Right. I remember turning the, I'm old. I remember turning it down. <laughs> But I just really like the idea of turning the whole TV down. Like, turn, it's like we're, I'm just turning it down. Like, mm -hmm. either turn down, like literally just standing it like on its face, or just like I'm turning down, like the idea of TV, right. turning volume down. So I just right. like there's so much folded in that, um, and the really sweet. I mean, we move from like this really sweet um, idea of like sort of insulation and protection in this uh, couplet or this like this cup pair of haiku all the way to where we sort of arrived at the end, which is like with much more sort of like psychological and emotional intensity. But this I think begins to prefigure that, um, the idea of turning down more than just volume, turning down like a whole host of, of things that could potentially wake the, the partner. Very so nice. it's just really, really sweet. Thank you so much. Stephanie, any final thought? The whole book. More than most contemporary poets who are this good with language, at the level of the syllable and the line, Foster thinks in books. And these haiku, each of which could be anthologized individually if you wanted, work in pairs that speak to other pairs, that speak to their place in the whole sequence called in somniloquies, not all of which are haiku, I think there are some couplets as well, which in turn speak to the entire architecture of this book, which imitates and responds to the structure of urban life. And I'm, I'm using urban here, not in the sort of odd euphemism where urban means black on the radio, although these are largely default black characters. I mean urban in the sense of just people living together in multifamily, multi-unit buildings, sharing transit, sharing a street, sharing commerce. The rooms and the people and the buildings and the blocks and the subway stops in a city work together in the way that the small units we've been talking about for the last 40 odd minutes. And the lines in Foster's 
book work together to create a whole that has semi-autonomous parts. That's really hard to do well. There aren't that many poets who've been able to do it. One of the ways this is an amazing book for me is the way the parts add up to that networked whole. The whole Thank you, Stephanie. Sitting. Yes. Thank you. Bonnie, final thought. Um, well, uh, I think given that she has, uh, as she announces at the back of the book, that she's taken on the job of, of speaking of a place and its grief, and it's an urban place, it's a very busy place, a very noisy place, so the tendency to um, overstimulation to, you know, to kind of being completely bruised, overwhelmed by the, mm -hmm. the amount of stimuli yeah. is there. So she has chosen a kind of extreme minimalism as a response to that uh, with a great deal of repetition. Not only, not only are these very short poems, but the same words, you know, yeah. keep popping up. Right. And each time there's a slight difference. So I find that counterpoint really interesting. I mean, mm. it's something clearly she's learned from many other writers. Langston Hughes comes to mind in particular as a way of um, responding to the urban setting, but it, mm -hmm. she's taken it further, I think. And, um, and so uh, as someone who loves Marianne Moore, uh, a minimalism of this kind is something that I need to work on and think about more. And, and what I uh, have enjoyed about our discussion is the way that, um, that, that it keeps yielding something, our attention, giving to our attention. Thank Curious you. projection of a occipital horn. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we love Marianne Moore? My goodness, what a character. Yeah, but even her short poems are not minimalist. Right. right. Well, my final thought um, is this. I had the great privilege of reading Tanya Foster's PhD dissertation, which no doubt, I'm not totally up on things, so it's possible that she's already preparing for publication as a book. I, I certainly uh, imagine she is and hope she is. There's a chapter in there on Claude McKay, which is the best thing huh. about McKay I've ever read. It's really huh. quite something. And she's studying Harlem Renaissance poets there, particularly McKay. Hughes is important to her as well. Um, when I read the uh, second of the haiku in a pair that we didn't discuss on page 47, I'll read it now and then oh, say what I'm in intending yeah. to say about it. <laughs> mm. um, and Harlem, she can't get tour buses of eyes to stop trailing through her thoughts. This really, we actually, the three of you already talked about this in a way, this idea that you know, thinking this is kind of, these poems are kind of small r renaissance. Is that possible? Yeah, you can do renaissance in a small r. There's a kind of Harlem renaissance in her thoughts here. The idea that this character is in Harlem and this character is trying to shut out the part of Harlem that is going to poetically and otherwise determine what goes on inside through kind of popularly generated cliches about yeah. a relationship like this. Um, She's really wrestling with this in a beautiful way. And this, this thing, that this, this, this haiku we didn't talk about fits with the others about being seen in a certain way and that being seen by tour buses of people, presumably people who want to see what's happening uptown, white tourists, people yep. who come from, from out of town and say, well, you know, I hear there's something going on in Harlem. And then having that, it's a little like there's so many accounts of... Um, early beatniks kind of taking advantage of the touring that was going on uh, in the hate, um, s somewhat similar to that. Seeking a poetry like McKay's that is not Harlem Renaissance in the way that came to be expected by poetic tourists, mm -hmm. but to see something else. I'm very moved by the deep engagement between this book and her dissertation, which are happening at the same time. Mm. Well, we like to end Poem Talk with a minute or two of Gathering Paradise, a chance for several of us, or all of us if we're quick, to spread wide our narrow Dickinsonian hands, at least mine are small, to gather a little something really poetically good to hail or commend someone or something going on in the poetry world. Who wants to gather paradise first? Anna. <laughs> yeah, I do. You look like you do. I do. Um, so I want to cheer for two previous 
uh, guests of Poem Talk, mm -hmm. uh, Kara Shear and Deanna Fong. Mm -hmm. um, we recorded, actually, I just got to listen to that recording of, of Poem Talk. I was in the room. Um, uh, it was in Montreal. In Montreal at Aaron Moray's house. Uh, mm -hmm. We recorded an episode of Poem Talk on uh, Gladys Maria Hindmarch's poem, Kitsilano. And mm -hmm. now, um, Kara Shear and Deanna Fong, two of those, um, have edited the new and collected poems of Gladys Hindmarch. And it is forthcoming, and it's going to be great. H-I-N-D-M-A-R-C-H, little known in the U.S., and, yeah. and actually not well enough known in Canada yeah. as well. Vancouver poet, really exciting, wonderful communitarian and poet, and, and I'm really, really excited to see um, how Karis and Deanna have, have collected and shared her work. Fantastic. Bonnie, gather some paradise for us, please. <laughs> well, my little uh, paradise uh, is a group of um, people who, these are all people from different walks of life, el uh, people uh, late in life, in 50s to 60s, who uh, six of them audited a class of mine, and uh, I invited them to uh, gather once a month and meet to talk about poetry. I, I said, the only rule is we can't, I'm not teaching it, and it can't be a poet I've, you know, I've written about. So uh, it, there was a lot in it for me as well. And this group has really evolved, and um, it's, a, it's just a wonderful experience to meet with these people. One's a psychiatrist, one was an oil engineer. They're just passionate about poetry and um, come incredibly well prepared for every session. And we have great discussions. And our last conversation was about a poet who doesn't need uh, for me to advertise her. Her name is Alice Oswald, mm. and her her new book, Falling Awake, is just astonishing. Um, she is now the Oxford poetry professor, so she's getting lots of, um, uh, of laurels, and, uh, but I do recommend the book very highly. You did a wonderful, sneaky thing. You got two recommendations. One was the idea of convening <laughs> non-specialist, you know, interesting, smart people to talk about poetry, and the other was a recommendation of a poet. Fantastic. It's called compression. You did a good job. <laughs> Stephanie, gather some paradise. The St. Louis Poetry Center is a growing and vital and regional entity that programs national and local writers and spoken word tradition artists and does a lot of work. I was there recently, Aaron Quick, who is the director, if I got the title right, uh, is doing a lot with the St. Louis Poetry Center in St. Louis. Kind of have to go to St. Louis for that. Two things you can get from anywhere in the world that I haven't written about yet, but might and would like to, are Paige Lewis's new and humorous and quirky and very serious and quasi but not really narrative collection of poetry, Space Struck, not Star Struck, but Space Struck by Paige, P-A-I-G-E Lewis. It's a first collection and you're going to be hearing a lot about it I think soon. And the various projects and anthology zine and also a single author book by the New Zealand poet Essa May Ranapiri, uh, last name R-A-N-A-P-I-R-I, -I, uh, who is at the sort of leading edge of a set of young trans and uh, gender variant and non-binary New Zealand-based poets. You're going to be hearing a lot from that cluster of writers who have various backgrounds and various interests soon, not just in New Zealand, but in North America, SMA Ranapiri's projects. Cool. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, uh, my uh, Gathering Paradise is this book, uh, which was organized by Nick Montfort along with a number of other poets. And I can't explain exactly the aleatory process that generated it. Can Nick uh, that explain is, it? I, yeah, actually, I can explain it, but I'm not going to use the time to do so. Um, it turns out that in this uh, couple of pages that I'm going to refer to, Nick reproduces the script. It's a very simple, short computer uh -huh. program that generates uh, the poems from a source text. And then what happened is he generated it in English, and he asked colleagues, these colleagues, to translate these three lines into other languages. And the act of translation was just as creative an act as 
it would have been had the poems been written by a human without the aid of computational text. So you get the translation that's happening in an ordinary translational way. The, uh, so you get, just to give you three examples, on the top left, you get the verso with the three lines that are generated by the computer program and then the translations. Here's one. The shopper looks at the cashier. She smacks her. Each one learns something. Then translation of that. Then the script, as it turns out. The next one. The shopper looks at the cashier. He berates him. They pray together. And then the last one that I'll quote. The rescuer locates the survivalist. He asks for advice from him. Each one learns something. So you get a sense of the reuse uh -huh. and the completely capricious and arbitrary and, and non-intentional, quasi-non-intentional quasi chance operation producing these mini stories in which cause and effect is arbitrary but plausible and weird and scary. <laughs> the book is called Two by Six. Well, that's all the turning the TV down we have time for <laughs> on Poem Talk today. Poem Talk at the Writer's House is a collaboration of the Center for Programs in Contemporary Writing and the Kelly Writers House at the University of Pennsylvania and the Poetry Foundation, poetryfoundation.org. Thanks so much, so, so much to my guests, Bonnie Costello, Stephanie Burt, and Anna Strong Safford. And to Poem Talk's directors and engineers today, they're behind the camera and behind the earphones. Mm -hmm. And we, they won't be seen, but they must be thanked, Zach Cardner and Chris Martin. And to Poem Talk's editor, the same amazing Zach Cardner. Special thanks to Christina Davis and Mary Graham, who's within hearing of this. Thank you, Mary. Thank you for letting us hang out here of the Woodbury Poetry Room, for being so accommodating to us as always. And a shout out to Nathan and Elizabeth Light for their very generous support of Poem Talk. In our next episode, Anna and I <laughs> will be back in the Wexler studio at the Writer's House in Philly, where we will be joined by Ahmad Amala, whose new book, by the way, is called Bitter English. I recommend it, Ahmad Amala, and Stephen Medcalf, longtime host of the Slate Culture Gap Fest, to talk about that always vexing poem, Mending Wall, by mm. Robert Frost. This is Al Filris, and I hope you'll join us for that or another episode of Poem Talk.